Hello to our audience in Mexico and to all those joining us in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, I'm Erika Ruiz Sandoval and I welcome you to the eighth online edition of the EU-Mexico Think Tank Dialogue Initiative. Renewable energies were growing steadily before the COVID-19 crisis. According to the International Energy Agency, renewable power capacity was calculated to expand by 50% between 2019 and 2024. However, due to the economic global crisis, the expansion of wind, solar, and other clean power sources is expected to slow down, at least temporarily. As part of the immediate consequences of the pandemic, the global shutdowns caused the energy demand to drop drastically, particularly in the areas of electricity and transportation fuels. This generated a complicated scenario as oil and gas prices reached historic lows and the geopolitical implications of this phenomenon for the energy sector became dire all over the globe. In the case of renewable energies, shutdowns halted the production of solar panels and wind turbines and shipping delays affected supply chains. Nevertheless, experts consider that in the long term, the strengths of renewables will remain solid. Today, the speed with which the pandemic affects clean energy will depend on the choices that political leaders make to incorporate them into the design of their economic recovery packages. For many, especially those focused on fighting the other big threat for our lives as we know them, climate change, Economic recovery must be green or it will hardly qualify as a recovery. This dialogue will discuss the broader geopolitical scenario in which clean energies are included, which seems to be the cha changing by the minute in a still uncertain international economic environment. It will present the, ma the main policy trends in the European Union and Mexico in terms of the generation and use of renewable energies before the current health and economic crisis. Finally, experts will share their insights on how these trends might change in the coming months and whether priorities have changed or adapted. To better understand what are the effects of COVID-19 on the clean energy transition, we will talk with Milan Elkerbut, Research Fellow of the Energy Resources and Climate Change Unit at the Center for European Policy Studies. William Jensen, Associate at the Mexican Council of Foreign Affairs, COMEXI, with significant experience in Mexico's energy sector. Isabel Rousseau, professor researcher at El Colegio de México and head of its energy program. And Lola Vallejo, climate program director at the Institute of Sustainable Development and International Relations, IDRI, in France. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts and expertise with us. As the conversation moves along, please post your questions uh, on the online chat of this webinar and address them to the expert of your preference. We will try to get to as many of them as we can with the limited time we have. So please be patient with us. Our first speaker is Dr. Isabel Rousseau. Can you tell us what the global energy scenario was like before COVID-19 and how have the health and economic twin crisis affected this sector and its development in the foreseeable future in Mexico? You have five minutes. Unmute your microphone, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Erika, and, uh, and thank you for the invitation. I would like to uh, speak about uh, two distinct topics. First of all, to try to give a general overview of the energy sector. Um, I would like to say first that uh, during uh, 2019, the different energy outlooks from, for instance, International Energy Agency or BP or so on, uh, shared a common forecast related to the main trends in the world energy mix towards 2040. That, that, that was more, more or less fossils declining to 40% uh, versus renewables increasing up to 24%. Even before COVID-19, the global context, that means world economic recession last year, uh, US-China trade tensions, new maritime transportation law, IMO, and that deals with the problem with the electricity also in Mexico, and also the oil prices fluctuation since 2017 represented uncertainty for the hydrocarbons industry that could accelerate the transition towards clean energies and particularly renewable energies. 
But what happens with COVID-19? COVID provoked global shutdowns in energy demand seven times more important than the impacts of the financial crisis in 28. This is very important. That means a historical collapse of oil prices. We saw in Mexico and in America negative prices uh, that could affect renewables. And also deep decrease of oil demand, more or less to, uh, nine percent, more or less. Deep decrease in natural gas, but also nuclear, not so much nuclear. And as for renewables, uh, new facilities building had been uh, deeply affected. The sole clean energy technologies that won't, that won't be affected are geothermal and hydro. I would like to highlight and expand on two things in this very general scenario. First, it is important to note that COVID-19 has affected oil demand for, for transport, but at accelerated petrochemical plastics demand, polypropylene, cellulose, and so on for PPE, personal protection equipment such as masks, gloves, and surgical wear. So not all hydrocarbon has been affected and prices are increasing again. So we cannot bury hydrocarbons so quickly. Uh, the second, the second uh, thing is the future of renewables after COVID-19 will be linked to the incentives the national governments will bring to promote them in their macroeconomical package to help the national economy to recover. I think it's very important to underline that. Now, in terms of Mexico, with regards to Mexico, first, obviously, Mexico has been very affected by oil prices collapse because of COVID. But it didn't change the role and the share of fossil fuels, oil especially, in the Mexican energy mix. And I think that the problem now for Pemex and for Mexico is what to do with the residual fuel oil, or RFO, uh, it's a, a combustible for Mexican people <laughs> or Spanish speaking people. In terms of clean energy, before COVID-19, I, I think that the role and place of renewables in Mexican energy mix have been modified since the beginning of the new administration. I don't know. With COVID-19, electricity demand lowered by 20%. Because of the norms of the grid operator, Senace, the cheapest energy has to enter first in the grid. That means solar and wind, and the fall of the demand implied to receive more renewables. The question is, the renewables generate direct current and the Mexican grid works with alternating current. So it's necessary to transform the current and Senace feared that this could imply a problem for the grid, risk of blackout during pandemics. This is the technical aspect. Now you have a legal aspect to decide suddenly with, without having any meeting previously with the different players to stop the test of the new projects. That could be called into question. Uh, with respect to clean energy, I think that the Mexican government's objecti objective is to promote the technologies that could be run by the national electric company, CF. And my, my last word is, uh, in this way, the government examines some technologies su such as nuclear and geothermal and renewables. They have most interest in promoting distributed generation projects in poor and isolated communities. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Rousseau. Milan, uh, the European Union has had as a priority to offer clean energy to all Europeans in 2019 the EU comprehensively updated its energy policy to facilitate the transition from fossil fuels to cleaner energy and to deliver on the EU's Paris Agreement commitment for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. 
Can you further explain what are the EU priorities in terms of energy and how do you think they have changed after the COVID-related global health and economic crisis? You have five minutes. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Erica, for uh, inviting me to be part of this dialogue. Um, so for the European Union, um, uh, everything uh, that has been discussed with regard to climate and energy uh, in the past months has been about the so-called European Green Deal. And as Europeans, we basically stole uh, Franklin Roosevelt's idea of uh, the New Deal from the 1930s, which was also needed to completely transform uh, the economy after a major crisis. Now, this is sort of to prevent a really big climate crisis from occurring, but the idea is also to really structurally address uh, the energy system and to make sure that the entire economy becomes a whole lot less uh, carbon intensive. Um, and this European Green Deal is a uh, political strategy. It's, it's not a law, so it's just a, a commitment of um, the, the policy makers and the countries that make up the European Union. Uh, and under that banner, they have made a, a whole lot of different proposals, uh, which need to be separately implemented into European law over the coming years. So uh, it's sort of a, a high level document uh, that tries to align the European economy with the goals of the Paris Agreement, but a lot of the details could still change. Um, the second important thing about it is that it is intended as a growth strategy to also help the, the EU uh, yeah, grow as an economy um, as a whole. And that element has become very important after COVID-19 because of the uh, enormous impact that will have on, uh, on employment and just on, uh, on GDP growth. So anything that can help investment and growth in general, uh, even if it's not only because it's green, uh, will be considered very desirable. So it's about bringing those two things together as well, the green part and supporting uh, economic investments. Now, what has really changed with the Green Deal compared to um, uh, the past uh, policy of the EU on climate and energy? Uh, I would say the most important thing is, is that um, Traditionally, uh, climate policy was always about the electricity sector and a little bit about transport, about electric vehicles, for example. Uh, and a lot of progress has already been made with, um, with electricity. Renewables are a lot cheaper now, and there are a few renewables companies like the, the Danish Orsted that are worth a lot more now than traditional energy companies. Uh, and that's really a sign of the times that yeah, the economy is, uh, is changing. Uh, but beyond electricity, where some attention really needs to be uh, turned to now is, uh, I would say, heat in a low carbon way. It's uh, about the heating of homes and also increasingly about cooling, which in your, not all parts of Europe is as important, but will become more so as temperatures go up but also about uh, industrial heat, high temperature. And that's a lot of different sectors like in, in steel and cement, chemicals production, uh, oil refineries. Uh, all of them have only a few percent of total emissions, but if you add them all up, then you easily end up with uh, about a quarter of emissions just as much as um, electricity. So there will be a lot more attention to those as well. Um, then it's very difficult to address some of these emissions and there's also risk associated with it and these risks will become more important after COVID, mainly the distributional consequences which you might have of climate policy. You want to make sure that uh, energy prices both for consumers and for companies don't get too high so that there might be competitiveness issues or even people not being able to afford the bills anymore. And this element also of a, a just transition will become uh, much more important than it would have been, uh, say, half a year ago, uh, when the first outlines of uh, the European Green Deal uh, were released. 
Um, so with that, I'll uh, hand back to you, Erica. Thank you so much, Milan. Uh, William, what has been Mexico's policy towards renewable energies in the last eight years when the first law on renewable energies was published? And what is the current policy? What role do you think renewable energy should play in terms of the overall economic recovery strategy of the country? You have five minutes, William. Well, uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for the invitation and good morning to you all. So, um, well, uh, the Mexican policy towards renewables in the past eight years is some less similar as other policies in other countries that entered the renewables revolution before. Uh, in some ways, Mexico is a late comer, but I think that it took advantage of the huge collapse in the cost of technology, even the cost of capital as well, and of course, an increasing desire to achieve a diversified energy mix. And I can identify three main uh, drivers for this renewables policy in the country. Uh, first, the international, the international commitments made by Mexico. Uh, Mexico is one of the champions in fighting climate change since uh, a lot of time ago. Mexico committed to accelerate the energy transition in the country. And as a result, Mexico joined uh, some international mechanisms that go beyond the institutional framework of climate change and joined other agencies, for example, the International Renewable Energy Agency or a strong participation in the Clean Energy Ministerial along with other international initiatives. Uh, second, I think that Mexico built a legal and institutional framework uh, very robust. Actually, for example, the National Commission for the Efficient Use of Energy was originated in 1989, for instance. So uh, trying to achieve a cleaner energy sector is nothing like new. So it has a long of, uh, of history behind. And uh, some legislation was passed like eight years ago the first dedicated legislation to renewables was passed by Congress. And that brings me to this uh, third driver, which is the, the energy reform of the past administration. That will, has as one of its purposes to reassess the, the role of the state-owned enterprises, such as the CFE, uh, consider the CFE as one player in a competitive market, but of course with a caveat because the, the CFE remained as the main player of the market controlling effectively transmission and distribution of electricity, for instance. Uh, the current energy policy of this government is of course different. It has a different perspective. Um, this administration is uh, focusing on the concept of sovereign energy transition or transition energetica soberana with a focus on boosting the role of the government and state-owned enterprises in the energy industry. Uh, this concept of sovereign energy transition is trying to focus as well on the social dimension of the electricity generation. For instance, focusing on the rights of the communities to benefit from the energy transition from the big scale projects in their territories under principles of not letting people behind and trying to listen the communities that are in those territories where huge uh, infrastructure is being built and uh, using uh, the electricity not as a service but as a right. And uh, of course, this administration has reaffirmed all the clean energy goals that uh, the previous administration had. And uh, I think that according to the Ministry of Energy, for example, there's about 31% of clean energy is now into the system. So COVID-19, of course, is going to have a, an impact on this, but uh, I think that there is a legal and institutional framework to cope with the challenges of this uh, pandemic. And I get back to you, Erica. Thank you, William. Thank you very much. Now, Lola, 
Uh, can the European Green Deal and specifically the EU policy towards renewable energies be at the core of the EU's external partnerships? If so, what place is left for renewable energies in its strategic partnership with Latin America after COVID-19? You have five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I, as, as my colleagues have already noted, uh, the Green Deal is a, a full transformation agenda with a very clear objective of reaching carbon neutrality by 2050. So nearly zero um, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it's the transformation of the energy sectors, but also sectors with, which use energy like buildings or transport to meet the Paris Agreement. Um, so the EU needs to update its current targets uh, and to put in place the policy so EU change itself, its relationship to energy. But interestingly, the Green Deal always had uh, a very strong external component uh, called EU as a global leader on climate and biodiversity issues. So concretely, there are maybe two things worth mentioning. The EU is considering uh, making the respect of the Paris Agreement, so very strong emission reductions, a core part of any future comprehensive trade agreements. So it's, it's trying to bring a lot more policy coherence to all the external diplomatic efforts of EU. Um, another way in which this could be enforced, um, which has been discussed a lot, is the question of carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism, which is another way for basically having some kind of carbon levy based on the content of carbon in different products, such as cement and steel, which are first obvious candidates for this. I think more broadly in terms of what could be the core of external partnerships. First, EU investing on itself to have a, a cleaner energy sector um, and an affordable energy sector um, is something that's going to help uh, any of external partners because you know, it, it spurs innovation and lower the prices, hopefully, for certain technologies that can then be also picked up um, by Mexico, who invest in, for instance, um, offshore wind, um, which you know right now maybe is not the most um, economically effective in Mexico, but could be in 20 years if also many European countries invest heavily in this. Um, but I think uh, also at the outset, there's a, a very powerful message that both continents are at the crossroads and need to invest significantly in their energy infrastructure. The question is, what are you going to invest in, you know, whether it's fossil fuels or uh, renewable energy? Um, and at IDRI, we coordinated uh, some domestic research teams in six Latin American countries, including in Mexico, um, that were trying to build uh, long-term decarbonization pathways. So trying to project from the current situation, how could all these countries reach carbon neutrality in 2050? And we showed using very sophisticated models that you could have a very high penetration of renewable energy, uh, including in Mexico, um, that the intermittency question was an issue maybe 20 years ago, but we'll have to catch up. And actually, uh, it's, it's not an issue anymore. And our by hour models show that you can very well function and have secure, affordable electricity using very high penetration of solar and wind. Um, there are other renewable energy benefits uh, for Mexico uh, that are also going to need to be first trialed and tested uh, in Europe because we also have a big challenge to decarbonize in Europe uh, and even though our economy is maybe less reliant overall in terms of tax base and in terms of uh, employment on fossil fuels we still have some local communities which are heavily dependent on uh, the extraction and the production of fossil fuels, um, including you know, some in Poland, in Germany, in Greece, in Estonia, um, Scotland, all come to mind. And the way in which we're going to be able to build a, a better social contract for those regions and to accompany these regions making sure that we uh, leave no one behind, which is another of the promise of the Green Deal, uh, is going to be a very important uh, area for cooperation because 
whatever we manage to learn uh, in trying to do that transition is something that we absolutely have to bring elsewhere to the world. And uh, I really hope that's, uh, that's something that can be strengthened. Thank you so much, Lola. So I'm optimistic at this point, apparently. Uh, but now let's talk about our bilateral relationship, uh, the European Union with Mexico. Um, we have collaborated for years in sharing experiences to fulfill our common objectives in terms of climate action. Through our political dialogue, we have advanced cooperation on specific projects to support the implementation of the Paris Agreement commitments, uh, the energetic transition and efficient energy use. However, uh, recently, uh, the measures decreed by the Mexican government in relation to renewables in the electric sector due to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, particularly those related to the indefinite suspension of clean energy plants operations and the restrictions on power generation, have created some uncertainty in the cooperation between Mexico and the EU on this vital issue. In face of this scenario, what are some of the possible areas of cooperation between the EU and Mexico to support long-term strategies for energy transition and to foster green economic growth after the COVID-19 crisis. We'll start with Dr. Rousseau. You have three minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Erika. And in terms of the low carbon business action, uh, EU has uh, with Mexico, I, I would propose the following actions. First, in terms of clean energy, I think that Mexico needs to develop its bioenergy and Europe has a large experience, Germany for instance, uh, to add 20 or 30 percent bioenergy, uh, it's, it, it's carboelectric plants. And that helps a lot to lower greenhouse emissions. And I think that Mexico could do the same with the three carbo it has in the north. So share experience training with Mexico could be very interesting. In terms of geothermics, Mexico has a large potential in geothermics because it's a volcanic country. And Europe developed a lot of activities based with geothermal processes to heat houses, buildings, and so on. The same, share experience and training. For, for instance, planning and regulation for efficient buildings in solar house for a large in experience in this aspect in some European countries and also in social and environmental impacts of the energy projects in order to avoid conflicts and also to respect the communities, share experiences, compare laws and rules and, and training people also. And in terms of hydrocarbons, I think that the European IOCs, uh, such as Total, BP, Shell, ENI, and above all, uh, the NOC, Equinor, the Norwegian NOC, can be very, very, very good models for Pemex to induce the Mexican oil state company to seek transformation into an energy company. Is I, I take my, <laughs> Uh, company Total, I'm French, <laughs> um, Total uh, declared and uh, Patrick Pouyanné declared that Total, uh, the objective of Total is not to be anymore an IOC, International Oil Company, but an IEC, an International Energy Company. And toward 2050, uh, the um, Total will have just 20% of oil production and 40% or 45 of renewables. I think that this good, could be very good models for Pemex and Mexico and Latin American NOC. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rousseau. Milan, you have three minutes, same question. Thank you, Erica. Um, I think uh, the first thing, uh, to notice that um, it should really be uh, between the EU and, and Mexico about a, a real partnership. And especially for the, the climate part, we should also keep in mind that uh, the Paris Agreement uh, is based on nationally determined uh, contributions. So whatever happens in, in either of the, uh, the two regions, 
uh, it should be based on a, a credible strategy, but that is really domestically uh, determined. It shouldn't be imposed from above. I mean, at the same time, it should be reasonably in line with also what is needed uh, to reach the long-term goals of the, the Paris Agreement, but it should be bottom-up. And here I think uh, there are some experiences of the, the EU that um, yeah, could also be, uh, be helpful in expanding their partnership. Um, and the EU has, uh, or is composed of a group of uh, very different economies, even though the goal is that they converge, but between Ireland and Bulgaria and Sweden and Malta, there are significant differences in uh, how the economy looks like and also the energy mixes of these countries. And even in the EU, it is a, uh, a goal that, uh, or not a goal, but uh, a rule that the energy mix of a country is up to that country itself to determine. It cannot be imposed from above. So, and nevertheless, uh, the EU has been quite successful in transforming uh, parts of uh, the energy system. Uh, so that should uh, yeah, uh, have created lessons that can be uh, shared with others. Um, at the same time, um, uh, trade also plays a major role in, in any partnership, and that also has a lot of uh, climate implications. And I think here uh, we should not just look at um, the border adjustments uh, that have already been mentioned, which are a very important potential tool, but they are also very defensive in that they, they protect the own economy. But if you already have a trade partnership, then it can also be a lot more focused on trying to diffuse and spread around different uh, low carbon technologies and partnerships based on that can also really help uh, the energy transition along. So there should also be a focus on that more, more positive trade agenda. Thank you so much, Milan. Uh, William, your thoughts? Uh, thank you. I uh, I agree with uh, with Dr. Rousseau about the importance for technical assistance to Mexico. But uh, to give you some uh, very specific examples on how the EU can back Mexico to achieve our national uh, clean energy clean energy goals, I can refer to the concept that the European Union has about the just transition, which is this concept of not letting no one behind and how to help those workers that are in hydrocarbons industries, how to train them, how to help those communities that before they were doing, uh, they, they were working on coal and uh, coal mining and nuclear and these uh, technologies that are being phasing out in the EU and how you actually can, uh, well, help those communities to get a new job in or a green job in this new economy. And one second, uh, as a second issue that the that the EU can help Mexico, I think, is the, in the new role of the of the consumers of electricity, which is the what it's called the prosumers. So you have your solar panel in your house, you are generating electricity, but you want to sell that electricity to your neighbor, for example. So you are now being a prosumer, so you're producing and, are, and you are consuming electricity at the same time. And the EU member countries have a lot of experience in how to incentivize this. And uh, by doing this, you are actually empowering people. You are uh, transforming the role of the citizen when it comes to the electricity sector. You are not talking about the big scale projects and programs that they have their own lifespan and are uh, now are already on like on the judicial system, etc. So this is a this is a I think a very noble uh, part of the of the electricity cooperation. And uh, another thing that Europe has a lot of experience is energy efficiency. People, I mean, I do believe that efficiency comes first than generating a lot of uh, electricity. So why not helping the Mexican small businesses and the Mexican industry to actually consume less energy and of course, 
to not to create more more jobs in this uh, field. So that would be all. Thank you so much, William. Uh, Lola, three minutes, please. Um, thank you. Um, uh, I think in terms of the possible areas of cooperation, um, I support some of what has already been said. Um, well, first, the, the energy efficiency, of course, is an important point. Um, but even beyond that, the, the, how the EU can do urban planning and kind of restructure its uh, transport systems also in a, in a way that helps to limit the transport demand um, and help support you know, either remote working or increase public transport infrastructure is another big way to reduce emissions. In Mexico and in France, the largest emission sector is transport and before even uh, power. So that's gonna be a very important one. Uh, support also the, the point by uh, William um, on the, the role of uh, renewable energy uh, also in, uh, from the citizen perspective. Um, the EU is also supporting citizen energy communities, uh, which is another way to better anchor the renewable energy projects in a local community and make sure that the profits are fairly distributed uh, and that they have a level playing field compared to um, non-community based projects. The, a second element of cooperation is uh, clarify for outside investors what counts as a, a clean energy investment and, and what doesn't, um, because there's a high demand from financial sector. Um, and of course, there is a lot of need to, to finance uh, upfront uh, investments and to lower the capital costs. So the International Sustainable Investment Platform is a very important new initiative from EU um, that is also a way to, to support its taxonomy efforts, uh, which I think could be interesting for Latin American uh, communities to, to contribute. Um, one last thing is uh, the just transition. It's not just a European concept. It's been developed by the International Labour Organization. Um, and as I said, the, it's going to be a very important piece as well. Uh, uh, the Just Transition Fund, whether it's appropriate in size and whether it goes to the right people, um, and whether we also have retraining programs for communities working in uh, fossil fuels is going to be a, a very important test and potential area for cooperation. And just one last note, maybe on the bioenergy question. Um, I think one, one very good thing of the Green Deal is it doesn't just focus on climate change, and it also looks at broader environmental issues, including preserving biodiversity. And I think once you have these two lenses crossing, uh, it forces you to maybe reassess some of the technical choices that you wanted to do. And as um, again, my, my colleague from Comexi was saying, uh, it really makes the point that uh, food security and preventing deforestation are, are really key. So supporting bioenergy, yes, but only if it's produced in a sustainable manner and bearing in mind that it's only going to be probably in the in the longer term a small uh, share of the overall energy needs and how we're going to provide. Thank you so much Lola. As in most things um, the devil is in the details I guess of I mean not everything that is called green is sustainable in the end or cost effective for that matter. But now we're gonna enter the Q&A session. Thank you very much for all your insights. And um, I guess uh, our, our audience is interested in the political side of energy. Energy is a very political issue for many governments, uh, not only because they're stakeholders and interest groups. As you mentioned, there's still some regions in Europe that depend on fossil fuels. And in the case of Mexico, it's more than evident. Uh, but the first question here uh, is how can the current administration in Mexico cope with an energy transition strategy towards renewables, given the reduction of the environmental budget in 2020? How will the renewable energy projects will be affected after COVID-19? I mean, if it's a priority, put your money where your priorities are. Uh, I would like to hear your thoughts, William. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have to remind that most of the renewable projects are actually private investments. So this is one first uh, thing to consider. 
And with the whole situation that it's uh, happening right now, perhaps there is going to be some sort of, uh, of, of a trouble there. Uh, however, I do see a big trend in the increasing of renewable energy in the Mexican, the Mexican system. For instance, in 2019, uh, we saw a 26% increase in wind installed capacity and a 76 percent in solar installed capacity and i think that this inertia is going to continue uh this year and that is why it was so or it is so important that the senace and the ministry of energy and all the key players uh, reach an agreement on how to better balance the system and how to integrate these huge amount of renewables into the system and uh, so i think that uh, not all the green investment from the mexican government has to go directly to renewable generation programs so the private sector can invest as well in the in the generation that's at least the legal framework that exists uh, today Dr. Rousseau, your thoughts on that? Because uh, again, if there's a legal framework, but there's some decrees going on and changing the rules in the middle of it all, can, can it still work? Please unmute your microphone. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Such as I underline in my exposition, uh, there is a, a diff uh, we, we have to pay attention on the difference between the technical aspect, and this is very important, and the legal aspect. No? Um, I think that uh, the technical aspect is real. Um, I am not an engineer, but I asked to many engineers uh, on, on, in electricity, and they explained that uh, renewables have this problem. And um, in Mexico, it is a problem because we don't have really a smart grid and we didn't invest, uh, but not only in this, during this administration, the previous administration didn't invest um, in transmission grid, in the grid. And so I think that uh, we have to take care on that. We have to modernize uh, the grid such as to, to, to have renewables won't be anymore such a problem, you know, when you have a low demand, for instance, a sudden low demand. So I would to, um, to, advi to advise about that. It's not um, only a problem of a generation, it's also a problem of storage and transmission. And I think that Mexico has to think about uh, this question very seriously. Thank you so much. Now we have another question and this will go to the Europeans. Uh, it says, I am concerned regarding the latest changes in Mexican politics and the state of law regarding the existing energy programs and policy. How can we ensure the commitment to accomplish the NDC and other goals? Is it necessary from part of the European Union to give incentives or a strategy of carrots and sticks? What, what do you think the European Union can do uh, in terms of also having its partners contribute to the global goal of reducing um, damaging emissions, etc. Lola, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you. Um, I think the first thing that uh, Europe can do is to invest in the credibility of the Green Deal itself. Uh, it's always the question around multilateralism. It's, it's a very complicated manner how do you ensure, you know, every, every country can argue we're only 1% of emissions. What do we matter? Maybe except if you're China, in which case it's a bit harder. But even China can say we produce things that, you know, other countries consume. So it's a never ending circle. The question is not about sticks uh, or even carrots. And it's more about the collective responsibility. And the Paris Agreement was about setting this common time frame and this common goal. Um, rather than you know, uh, just enforcing uh, sticks and compliance and enforcement mechanism. There is no enforcement, except maybe the pressure that can come from a population or a business community not to be left out from where the world is going. So I think if EU invests, 
its main uh, diplomatic uh, stick, in a way, is the size of its market. And if the European market has a, a new demand for clean products, and if European companies are ahead of the curve and are seen as innovators and contribute to having a competitive edge, then I think that's that we can also show that this is a credible way forward. Um, I think there are other reasons why reducing inequalities and having more livable cities, uh, having better quality of life and shorter commute times is also uh, desirable for plenty of other reasons than caring about climate, which can seem maybe a bit abstract at times, even though less so these days. But basically, I would say investing in the Green Deal is the best thing that uh, Europe can do to uh, to prove to Mexico that uh, it's a way forward. Thank you, Lola. But it seems that after COVID-19, uh, we'll have to invest in many different things just to rescue populations, economies, um, businesses, small, medium enterprises, etc. Uh, will there be any money left, uh, not only to, to push forward the, the European Green Deal, but also to invest abroad? What, what are your thoughts, Milan? I think it's a false uh, dichotomy because, well, first, it's, thanks for reminding that, uh, that even in Europe, the Green Deal is, you know, it's a very strong political project and there have been some um, thoughts, uh, I mean, a, a strong support from the citizen population, but there are also a lot of tensions. And I come from France, we had the yellow vests, which have caused ripples around the world. So we know implementing the transition is, is not necessarily going to be smooth and will require a lot of deliberation and a lot of support to the most vulnerable, uh, whether it's the most vulnerable countries worldwide or the most vulnerable communities. Um, first, we have new governance models like the citizen assemblies or citizen panels to kind of devise uh, policy measures, which I think is an interesting model that has started to, you know, ripple around Europe. Um, but even in Europe, you have a lot of pushback from certain countries which are understandably wary of how this is going to be implemented. We should be careful not to distinguish phases too much. You know, it's not first you rescue the, rescue the, the, this is a sanitary emergency, but you can't separate rescuing the companies and then investing in green stuff. You know, it's, you have to invest a lot of money anyway to inject momentum in the economy. The question is, what are you going to invest in? And you can't leave the destroyed companies just wither and die. Like, you know, you can't just leave airlines die uh, right now, but you have to give really strong commitments on if we support you, how can you ensure that you're going to help us meet our national goals and our national uh, laws, you know, which are going to carbon neutrality. Okay. And I think that's going to be a key, a key marker of whether we have been successful in dealing with uh, the post-COVID time. But the post-COVID is going to last for a long time. We're in it, you know, there's a fir first wave, there might be others. So it's, uh, you know, I don't think we should view it as a different sections or different pieces of the cake. It's going to be a continuum and it has to be um, always uh, implemented in a, in a way that has these goals in mind. Otherwise, the policy is inconsistent. Thank you, Lola. Milan, do you agree with Lola in, in terms of uh, it going hand in hand? I mean, the European Green Deal has to come hand in hand with the recovery strategy and will that work well politically in most of the European Union member states? Or is the Green Deal at some kind of risk because of the COVID-19 change of priorities? Uh, yes, no, first of all, um, I couldn't agree more with the points Lola just uh, made. And I would also say that um, even if the EU is acting um, sort of focused on its own economy in advancing certain climate and energy measures, it can still have a very important positive impact on any other region around the world. If they create a market, an initial market for certain low carbon technologies, uh, and then the costs of these can come down and that could help uh, yeah, other countries to implement them. So even this domestic focus can be important for others. Um, I also uh, th yeah, think that um, it is very important to see the, the COVID uh, response and the Green Deal as complementary, not as 
as opposites. Um, and there have been uh, yeah, quite some discussion on this. In March, the early signs were a bit negative with a lot of countries uh, in, uh, for example, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, Czech Republic, for example, uh, saying uh, that, well, now that we have such a, a public health crisis and an economic crisis, let's reassess our priorities and first focus on yeah, uh, the regular economy. But even those most skeptical countries have turned around and are now in agreement that by supporting uh, green investments, you can also support general economic uh, recovery. So that really is a, a quick turnaround in two months. I do think there are risks, uh, but they more have to do with the timeline of the investments in that um, some of the investments that could have an immediate positive impact just on, on general citizens and consumers, such as uh, giving credit or subsidies for um, renovations in homes that have a positive impact on energy efficiency. Those can be very positive in, in the short term and also have an immediate economic boost. But you also need to make sure that, uh, uh, especially in the EU perspective, that they are compatible with the long-term climate goals. And there, the objective is very uh, ambitious. It's to reach uh, climate neutrality in 2050. Uh, and what I think everyone needs to avoid is that you ask great sacrifices of consumers right now uh, but that it's still not enough to reach climate neutrality. Uh, so that is a challenge to really bring that in line. Thank you. Um, William, we have questions about indigenous populations uh, in Mexico and the relationship with renewable energies. You in passing mentioned uh, some of these, but after COVID-19, these populations will be even more vulnerable. That's what we're thinking. Uh, ca what can we do together with the European Union um, to, to change the future for these populations using renewable energies? Uh, well, first of all, there is a legal framework in Mexico to implement the 169 Convention of the ILO, which is about consultation on indigenous communities. And uh, I think that the international experience is always welcome. Uh, but I think that in Mexico, we, we have enough resources, I mean, not resources, but uh, the legal framework to address this issue. And yes, I agree entirely that some communities were actually left behind in the past because of these uh, big scale projects in indigenous communities. And I think that COVID-19 actually gives us a, a very good opportunity to address uh, these small communities that were left behind with new technology, such as distributed generation, they can generate their own electricity there, and they can actually benefit from the from the exploitation of their natural resources. So, with a community-based approach, I think that they are going to benefit largely uh, from the energy transition. Thank you, William. Uh, Dr. Rousseau, we have another question that goes again back to geopolitics. Uh, what can the European Union do to bring on board some countries like China or the US into contributing to the fight against climate change? And if, can Mexico help in any way or form to change that scenario? Um. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I have problem with it. Um, yeah, uh, before um, uh, responding to you know, the, the question, I just would like to add something about what William uh, said before about indig uh, indigenous uh, consulting. I worked a lot about that and I examined um, during one year and a half all of the framework for indeed indigenous uh, consultation and I think that the new legal framework uh, elaborated in, uh, in, uh, two, in 2014 has a lot of lacks and holes and so I think that we have to review this, uh, this framework. It's very urgent for Mexico, uh, for all the, the energy project and for communities, indigenous or not indigenous communities. Um, um, 
as a matter of the the other question is quite difficult you know to make pressure about uh, china and united states um, i'm not sure that uh, uh, european union has the <laughs> could convince those both actors to uh, really um, have more um, uh, present commitment with the climate change um, in uh, in Mexico it's quite impossible because first Mex Mexico ha will have to have a much better commitment and strong commitment with a deal a green deal and so I, I cannot see Mexico as an actor to push uh, China and uh, and United States uh, in the towards this direction uh, I, I cannot say any more about that <laughs> it's quite difficult Okay, thank you, Dr. Russo. Uh, there's a question here about how some uh, EU member states uh, still use um, <coughs> high, they have higher consumption on petroleum products than renewable energies. Which measures are taken at the EU level to promote change? Milan, other than leading by example from other member states and also having this political directions such as the European Green Deal, what else can you do to change minds? Um, I think in the EU it's not really only just about changing minds anymore, but uh, at some point hard regulation um, yeah, comes into play and to get rid of um, yeah, oil, petroleum in, in transport, for example, there are uh, CO2 standards apply to every new car that is being built and these standards are also strengthened over time so we know or car makers know that um, by 2030 they across the average of all the cars they sell they need to reach a certain um, performance in terms of the emissions and they are sufficiently strict that you can only reach that by selling more electric vehicles in the market because that will bring down the average. So that is one way to uh, address it. And I would say another one, uh, if you talk more about uh, industrial use of fossil fuels, then uh, hydrogen is a potential alternative. This can also be produced in a, in a green way with electrolysis and electricity. It's not easy to do, it's also expensive, but the European Commission is now planning a specific strategy to help develop this, also because of the, the versatility of hydrogen. You could use it across a whole range of different um, uh, sectors, also for energy storage, for example, or, or even in heating in some cases. Uh, so that's a major part of the Green Deal as well. Thank you, Milan. Lola, we have a question here. It says, could Eurocam, which represents more than 18,000 companies, have a role in persuading the Mexican administration of the importance of investment in renewable energy? What has your experience been regarding the power of foreign companies in the different Latin American countries in pressuring governments to change their policy? Um, I would be careful to use these words because I, I dislike the idea that it's foreign companies that dictate what the national government does when it's been elected by its citizens. Um, so I think, however, the, the, the domestic business community uh, does have a role to play and is, can be often at odds with its own government, and we've seen that in Europe and elsewhere. Um, so I think the business voice in itself is very powerful uh, because it's something that governments respond to, but it's not the only thing. The, I think the citizen movements and the, the various marches, the youth movements um, have also had a, a surprisingly strong impact on what the politicians have committed to in the recent months um, up until the, the COVID response. I, I think, however, the, the fact that uh, European businesses in Latin America uh, and in Mexico in particular represent uh, just a, a source of investment and a, a source of development. So, it, you know, these companies want to produce uh, uh, and to develop and to invest in the country to produce things that are better aligned with 
uh, their strategic plans, then in a way their strategic plans uh, can impact uh, how the government sees credibility also of the, you know, the sovereign energy transition question. Um, so I think it's more of a, a rebound aspect. I, I don't like to see it more as a direct lobbying, but if companies start to change their investment plans and the type of you know, vehicles or uh, the type of parts that they require Mexico to produce, um, whether for domestic consumption or for exportation, and I think that uh, as a knock-on can have an impact on uh, the national positions and the national debate. William, what's your take on that? Do you think um, the Mexican administration needs some persuading in terms of the importance of investing in renewable energy? Well, I think that this is a this is a matter of uh, a, a more like a philosophical matter. You know, it's how this administration is seeing its role or the role of the state in the energy industry. If this administration is seeing this uh, role as the most important thing for, for them, so I, I mean, that's uh, as uh, my colleague said, a democratically elected government. So they, they for sure, they want to pursue a bigger role in the electricity or in, in the whole energy sector, right? And uh, taking this into consideration, I think that a, a yes, so I mean, if the companies were affected by these uh, decisions, they have the right to go to the tribunals as they have already done. And this is a matter of uh, legislation and not, I mean, of the legal framework and not for the technical part, as Dr. Rousseau said, which is really important to understand that, for example, for the system operator, the SENACE, it is really hard to integrate renewable variable energy when they didn't have enough uh, infrastructure or resources to do so. So it is not that this administration is like, uh, stating something against renewables, but who is in charge and who is the main player in the energy sector? Now we have the answer. Is the state, okay, well, what they are going to do with this new role that they are envisioning? Okay. Well, we have uh, very little time left, so I will just ask you all to give a final word um, before we, we part. Uh, Dr. Rousseau, a final word on, on this issue. Okay, thank you very much. Very, very briefly, um, I think that uh, there is, uh, it's, uh, it's very necessary for Mexico to strengthen cooperation with EU to diversify a relationship versus North America. Um, and it's a question of sovereignty for uh, Mexico and also national security, national energy security. Above all, because of the strong Green Deal commitment of EU. And I think that uh, EU has a lot to share with Mexico in terms of green energy. And because I'm a, an academic, I would say that perhaps in terms of education, education of the population, education of the communities, education of in many ways, I think that we can share a lot of um, experience trainings from the EU. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rousseau. Milan, a final word? Uh, yes, um, just very shortly why it matters to have a, a good partnership between uh, the EU and Mexico. I, mean, I would say that any uh, partnership between major economies uh, and major economic blocks is very important, uh, not just because of um, uh, the geopolitical trends of the last five years, which are not too positive for multilateralism, but also because if you do not have these partnerships, uh, and especially where you can combine trade and climate policy, uh, then the type of domestic policies you need to follow um, on climate uh, need to be a lot more inefficient because you constantly need to look at what others are doing and uh, protect your own economy and uh, look at industrial competitiveness. So with more partnerships, you can actually develop economically more efficient
policies and that should be in the interest of all. Okay, thank you, Milan. William, final word? Yep, thank you. So technical assistance is crucial. So could we can exchange and share best practices among the two countries, company to companies, government to government, business to government. Uh, the new role of discussions and the new role of the presumers, I think that are crucial, of course and the digital revolution, that it's uh, something that it's happening right now as we speak. And it's something that both, both uh, I mean, in this, this not countries, but member countries and Mexico can have a lot of exchange. Thank you, William. Lola, your final thoughts? Um, thanks. So support the points made uh, by others, um, but maybe just to add on the, the social aspect, which I think is a, going to be a very normal preoccupation following the COVID crisis. Um, I think the clean energy transition, if done well, and in you know, collaboration with the local communities, and I think now we have enough initiatives around citizen ownership that we can rely on and try and learn from. Uh, it has potential to provide access to energy and affordable energy. Um, and there is also a key question on how to support the transition of those communities who now rely on fossil fuels and ensure that these communities don't die, but we retrain them and ensure their skills are not lost, but used in a, in a different manner towards a, a cleaner economy. And I think Europe is very keen to tackle that challenge. And I think it's something that's going to resonate very, very much in Latin America. I would really hope and support that these cooperation angles are, are clearly investigated. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for your participation, for this discussion, for your insights, your ideas, your proposals, and your knowledge. Uh, I think we identified many of the tasks ahead. I think we reaffirmed that the European Union and Mexico in the end are in this together, and we should find a work, uh, way to, to contribute to each other um, to exit the COVID-19 crisis in better shape and never forget about the environment. We thank our audience for joining us uh, and invite you all to fill out the survey that you will be sent by email and see you here next Tuesday, uh, same time, same place for yet another conversation on European Union Mexico perspectives on COVID-19 related issues. Thank you all for joining us and be safe. <laughs>